And yeah, so what else do I have to do? Unmute myself? Uh, no, you just, uh, I think that the yeah, volume goes here. Yeah, here. so I'm not muted. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 Maybe no. you want to start the video too, or does this show my face? <laughs> yeah. I think it's appropriate to turn off the video because if you record, you want to record your screen. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. And share, share the screen and it's recording. Okay, so yeah, yeah, right. it's, it's, it's right. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Um, today we are very happy to have uh, Professor Subir Sashkar here. Uh, Subir is um, uh, famous for a lot of things in Connect Matter. Uh, including the quantum critical uh, phenomenon, quantum based translation, a uh, theory of architecture, and a lot. And uh, we're happy here that he will uh, tell us the relation between the strange metal and black hole. Uh, yeah. okay. okay, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, glad to be here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't see any pure mathematicians in the audience. I think, uh, maybe Michael a little bit. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I tried to, you know, take seriously this is a, a presentation for mathematicians and try to make at least a few precise statements. Uh, so I will uh, start by describing the SYK model. Uh, now, why did that happen? Maybe uh, let me Okay. Do this here. All right. Okay. Hopefully that's going to continue to work. Um, so I'll describe the SYK model as a purely mathematical problem and what we know about it. Uh, and then, even though this is a toy model that we love to solve, uh, it turns out to have connections to physical systems. And I'll try to make, in some cases, rather precise connections. And I'll try to spell out exactly what they are. Okay. So let me just begin uh, as a mathematician defining the problem. And the problem is really defined here in these three lines. Uh, that's all you need to know in principle. Uh, you have some fermionic operators uh, with index alpha, C alpha. Alpha goes from one through N. And these operators all uh, anti-commute with each other. Uh, and then if you take the, the anti-commutation between the fermion and the commission conjugate, well, then you get a one for the same operator on the right-hand side. So there's this algebra of these operators. Um, and from this algebra, we're going to define a Hamiltonian. Uh, and the Hamiltonian we're going to pick is one right here. It's got the, the very interesting term, which is this uh, four product of four of these Grassmann type of fermionic operators. Um, and there's a coefficient. These are complex numbers chosen so that the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. Um, and so in principle, there's, uh, since these anti-commute, gamma and delta have to be distinct, uh, but ignoring that subtlety, there's n to the power of four of these uh, complex numbers. Okay, so you have to pick some set of numbers. Um, and in fact, in the, I'm interested in the limit of very large n, uh, and in the limit of very large n, uh, this, this particular model um, has uh, its self average. In other words, it doesn't matter which ones you pick. With probability one, you're gonna get the same answers, at least for the quantities that I'm gonna compute. Um, okay, so the U alpha beta gamma um, have zero mean for convenience uh, and root mean square value U squared. And the most important property is that they're independent random variables. Uh, so you have N to the fourth independent random numbers. And you just pick one set. You don't have to do anything more, just pick one and we'll study its properties. Uh, now, of course, 
uh, I can't, I cannot give you the exact answer. That's just too complicated. This matrix uh, acts on a space, which is dimension two to the n, uh, because each fermionic state can either be empty or occupied, uh, and there's n of them, so possibly have two to the n states. Um, and so, but there is one operator that uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, which is just the total number of particles normalized by the number of sites. And this has to be between zero and one. Okay. So the properties do depend on exactly what the value of Q is. And mostly I'll focus on right in the middle, Q equals one half. All right. So this is what now, I guess, now people call it complex SYK model. Uh, the model that Kitev introduced was in Meyer on fermions. It has basically the same properties. Uh, but once we get to more condensed matter uh, issues in the, towards the end of my talk, uh, we I prefer to use the complex one. All right, so, so I can just write down these three lines and give them to my mathematician friends and tell them, tell me something about this problem. It's fully defined by this three lines, that's all. <laughs> okay. Uh, you could also take models with six fermions and eight fermions. They all have very similar properties. Uh, the one with two fermions is kind of trivial. So the four is the simplest non-trivial case. Okay, so we want to know something about these. So, so now, of course, today, a whole lot is known. Uh, but in this talk, I will just talk about one quantity, uh, which is the partition function. So I'm just going to compute for a given value of Q, uh, the trace, of the exponential of uh, the Hamiltonian divided by the temperature. And as usual, this defines uh, the free energy, F. Uh, this will be of order N, the free energy. Uh, and the entropy is the uh, thermodynamically defined as the derivative of the free energy. Okay. So this, this is what a condensed matter physicists want to compute. And I want to, you know, to learn something about this quantity in the large element. So it's really a counting problem. I just have to count uh, states with, the different, with each energy uh, and then combine them in this exponential with the weight given by the temperature. Okay. Uh, another way to express this is in terms of the many body density of states. Uh, you know, we define that, for example, in this formula, if there's a delta function, uh, of this many body density of state for each many body eigenvalue, uh, E sub i. Uh, and so this is the many body density of states. Now, to determine the many body density of states is an impossible task because to, it's really a series of delta functions. And you want to know exactly where each delta function is. Uh, uh, that means you have to know exactly all the EIs. There's two to the n EIs. Uh, and, uh, well, all of you fix Q, then there's a bit smaller, but that's fine. Uh, and that's impossible. So that will depend on exactly what set of numbers you alpha, beta, gamma, delta you pick. Uh, but even though that's impossible to compute, uh, when you compute this Laplace transform, that becomes much better defined. It's a much smoother function. Uh, and, uh, and that's pretty much what we're going to compute. And also compute some D of E which will be a smooth function. And then smooth means you're coarse graining over some very fine scale. And that fine scale you're coarse graining over, you know, vanishes faster than any power of one over N. So it's really very fine and it's still, and then once you do that little bit of coarse graining, uh, then you get a universal answer, which is completely independent of all, uh, which U alpha beta gamma you picked, okay. <laughs> So these are actually quite remarkable properties. Uh, if you take free fermions, it's not self-evident as well. You have to do a little bit more cross graining uh, And, uh, but you know, roughly this happens because the Hilbert space is so large, the Fox space is two to the n size. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the states are extremely chaotic. That's really the, uh, the defining property of this model that it's, Extremely chaotic and self average is better than almost anything else. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Uh, not yet. I will. 
I will. <laughs> Did I make a mistake somewhere? Okay, please tell me all my mistakes. <laughs> I will. I mean, I, will, I was preparing them until like half an hour ago, so <laughs> I was changing a few things. I hope you like my new title. <laughs> okay, so let me just tell you the answer. What do we know about Z of Q and T and, and D of E? Uh, and this has been checked by numerics. There's absolutely no doubt what the answer is. Here's the answer. In the large end limit, uh, you know, this is what D of E looks like. First of all, it's exponentially large. Uh, and there's a leading term, which is e to the n times s0. And s0 is a pure number that we computed over 20 years ago. You can see it's one of my favorite numbers. <laughs> and uh, I kind of I won't show you how it's done, but uh, you have to go read this paper or, or some other article. And then there's another factor which depends on energy. This is an overall prefactor. This depends on energy. It's a cinch uh, and it depends on the square root of energy. Now, the energy is the extensive energy, so also of order n. So this whole thing is also of order e to the n. But in fact, the cinch holds even when the energy becomes much smaller. Uh, so this cinch factor is rather remarkable because it describes a crossover from where uh, the energy is extensive to where it's not, where it becomes much smaller and very close to the ground state. So one you know, fun exercise I recommend you do, you take the cinch, you plug it in here, you compute the partition function and you compute the entropy, and this is what you'll get, okay? And that's just a Laplace transform of the cinch. It's a lot easier than taking the inverse Laplace transform. Uh, all right, so this is the thermodynamic quantity, uh, which has, a, so it has a number of strange terms. First of all, there is a, as temperature goes to zero, that least if I take the large n terms, there's a zero temperature entropy, S zero. That's what this magic number is. It's the entropy per site in the zero temperature limit. But it's a zero temperature entropy in the limit where you send n to infinity first and then t to zero because it's the large n. Then there's a correction with a minus three half. Uh, and this three half is highly universal and will also play a big role in the first part of my talk when I talk about black holes. And now just comparing these two terms, you can see that when temperature is e to the minus n, then this term can become bigger than that, and this entropy uh, formula makes no sense. But temperature of e to the minus n is extremely small. It's basically level spacing. And so at that point, you have to worry about the discreteness of the levels. But before that, you don't. Thanks. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so I'm going to show you how it's done. If you want to get this factor, you need the full SYK. Uh, this cinch factor is actually far more universal. It applies to all kinds of things, uh, and it comes. It was. It's from that one of gravity. It's JT gravity. you watching. Huh? No, you do need it. I don't know of any other way to do it. It's uh, that's the way everyone has done it. <laughs> Yeah, even, I mean, there's also Arkland and even the condensed matter side has done it using this Louisville theory. Louisville quantum mechanics can give it to you, but that's basically gravity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't think they're very well understood. I mean, Certain things are understood uh, by these wormhole terms, which are exponentially small in n, but it's going to be exponentially small in n. Let, let me just show you a few pictures. So if I just take us, I think this is 16 sites, and I then I have two to the 16, which is some huge number of eigenvalues. I just bin them into nine tiny bins, uh, and then this is the this count, and this is the density, this is D of E. Okay, this is what it looks like. Uh, all right. Um, then, so how do I understand this? So first of all, uh, over here, I can, this behavior uh, is given by when the cinch becomes uh, essentially an exponential. And that's also very easy to understand. So let's say the entropy, you accept that the entropy is a constant in the large end limit plus a term linear in temperature. 
So that's the result in what we call the canonical ensemble. To get D of E in the thermodynamic limit is just the exponential of the entropy. But this is the entropy in the microcanonical ensemble. So we just have to convert the canonical to the microcanonical ensemble by the usual formulae of thermodynamics. Uh, uh, and basically, you know that the entropy F we have Pt is minus S, and you know that F is E minus Ts. Uh, and you have three quantities, and from this you can convert S of T to S of E. So I'll leave that as an exercise. Uh, and when you do that, you'll find that S of E uh, is the square root of 2n gamma E, because gamma is the same as that. So this tells you why you have the square root here. And they say, oh, these are both exponentially large terms. We're just doing thermodynamics. Uh, and this is the zero temperature entropy. For, and this is the square root of these terms. So you see the square root of A is simply the consequence of the linear temperature dependence of the entropy. Even a Fermi liquid would have the square root of E term. <laughs> a Fermi liquid wouldn't have the S zero, but it would have the same square root of E. Okay. However, let's go to very low energies. Uh, if you go to very low energies, then this formula says that first of all, this E to the N NS naught will survive. So that's there. And then, however, we also know that at very low energies, you know, maybe it behaves like a random matrix. And every random matrix has a square root edge in the density of states. So in fact, what happens is that there is indeed a square root of edge, square root of energy edge. Uh, and that's how you should get this. And so now you have to interpolate between this and this. And, and that's, of course, just the cinch is the simplest function that interpolates between e to the square root of e and square root of e. And that turns out to be the exact answer. OK. Um, all right. So now what's going on here? So the most important thing I want you to note is that even though there is a zero temperature entropy, the ground state is not degenerate. The ground state is almost essentially unique. The lowest energy state is very is unique. But there's a whole bunch of excited states here, which are very, very close. They are exponentially close. In fact, this level spacing here is e to the minus n s naught. So they're exponentially close to each other. And that, you know, like in that matter language means that uh, you don't have any quasi particle excitations. If you did this for if you had a two fermion term these low-lying states would not be exponentially close. It would be one over n apart. And that tells you that there is no quasi-particle basis. Uh, and in fact, these states are, you know, we'd love to understand more about them. This is like the ground state of this model and it's excited state. So the first state and the next state are completely different from each other. I mean, the space is so big, you know, size 2 to the n, when, when n is a thousand, that's ridiculously big space. In that ridiculously big space, uh, every state is completely different and chaotic. It just happens to be close to each other in energy. And that happens all the way down to the ground state. Now, when you have quasi-particles, what happens is that you have a ground state. And then the first excited state is you just remove one electron or add one electron. It's a slight, it's a very small deformation, deformation of the many body state. Here, that's not OK. So that's the basic physics, the simple model captures uh, this exponentially large density of low energy states, which are chaotically different from each other. Okay. So now, of course, so to answer Pavel's question, you want to get every single level, I have no choice but to really diagnose the whole thing in a big computer. But if I'm happy to do an even little bit of post training over an exponentially small energy interval, uh, certainly about a one over n, maybe even faster than that, I, I suspect, uh, independent of uh, um, what you, you alpha, beta, gamma you chose, you will get distances. Okay. All right, so that's my mathematically precise statement of a mathematically precise model. Uh, and now, you know, we're going to try to become much less mathematically precise. But I was hoping there'd be some mathematicians in the audience. So my challenge to the mathematicians uh, is to derive this using rigorous methods. This is not rigorously proven. It's 
physicist methods, but <laughs> there's no doubt it's correct, but it'd be nice to have a rigorous understanding of this and what the corrections are to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you change a different, uh, so the, of course the value of gamma is highly non universal. It depends on everything, including you. Uh, the value of S naught will change. Well, we know that we are, we, there's a function S naught of Q that's in our paper already in 2004. Why do you choose one half because of the uh, symmetric symmetry? Uh, because it has this very nice number. <laughs> it's some complicated integral that I cannot do for Q equals to one, not equal to one half. <laughs> can, can you summarize the method? And uh, yes, so it relies actually on some rather remarkable identities between. There's like the Lattingeal theorem you have to derive between the charge and the particle hole asymmetry of the spectrum. Uh, and then there's also a thermodynamic identity uh, between um, how the entropy changes with charge. Uh, that turns out to be equal to 2 pi E, where E is the particle hole asymmetry. But the curious thing is when you go to black holes, if you have a charged black hole with an electric field on the surface, this E is the electric field on the surface. Uh, this is the entropy and the charge of a black hole. So the same equation had been obtained earlier by Ashok Sen when he was studying ADS2 black holes. And it, this also comes out of the SYT same relation. Uh, and then we integrate this equation to get this. <laughs> yeah. If you want to get the answer exactly upon half, there's other quicker tricks. Um, you need some dimensional regularization and so on. You take derivative with respect, you take the Q for me on model and you take derivative with respect to Q, that's another way to do it. Okay. As you can tell, I've spent way too many years of my life having fun with these identities. <laughs> so, right. They're just, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to show you. I'm going to show. That's what my talk is about. Sorry. Well, so first of all, this is not a random matrix. Uh, if I had a truly random matrix, this is a matrix of size two to the n. I would have two to the n random, two to the n squared random numbers. That's what a random random matrix theory has: n squared random numbers, where n is the size of the matrix. Here, the size of the matrix is two to the n by two to the n. So that I'd have two to the two n random numbers. I only have n to the four random numbers. It's a highly organized matrix by that point of view. Nevertheless, it's chaotic enough. Even n to the four random numbers, it's a very sparse matrix. Most <laughs> matrix elements are zero. Uh, even this very sparse matrix, exponentially sparse matrix, has enough chaos to have certain aspects of random matrix theory. So. Yeah, so what's as Charles Schenker and Stanford have shown, you can also get the same result. You know, the same result appears is the cinch from a random matrix ensemble, but you have to take a double scaling limit of a random matrix ensemble where you go down to the bottom of the band for a very specific potential, which is designed to give you the cinch. Yeah. Uh, here I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm. You know, much more work in that matter point of view. I'm, I'm just taking some random numbers in, and I'm working in Fox space rather than, yeah. So there's no sense that you're averaging the ensemble? Or is uh, so these are all self averaging. Of course, to do the calculation, you do average, but then you can check that the fluctuations about the average are not all important. I mean, that's the beauty of having random numbers. It actually simplifies the problem because you can average. And sometimes the averaging is a very obvious thing. Okay, any other questions? So, you know, there it is. It's a, I've at least made one precise statement. <laughs> Here's a very precisely well defined Hamiltonian. It's an ensemble of Hamiltonians, but they're all pretty much the same. And this is what its density of space looks like. Um, and they're just, enormous amount of information hiding in the structure of these density states. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
it, it uh, S naught becomes half the value basically. <laughs> and uh, the value of gamma will also change unpredictably. You have to do a full computation to get gamma. But S naught is exactly half as large. That's all. <laughs> Okay, so now let me, uh, so now we understand the results and how we can compare it to actual numerics of this many body system. Uh, let me show you how it's done. <laughs> Very crudely, I won't go through all the details. Uh, so you take the original model and you go ahead and average over the U's. Uh, so this is really the average of the partition function. Write it as a packet integral. Uh, and then when you average it, you get the c to the fourth term, uh, c dagger c to the power four. And the most important thing about this term is that tau and tau prime are it has two different times. All other terms at the same time, it's really bilocal in time. So that looks scary. Something is bilocal in time. Somehow your theory is non-local or something has longer interactions in time, uh, but it's not. I mean, and that's really the which we know is not because it started from a Hamiltonian that was time independent. All right. Uh, and the solution, and the saddle points we look for will have that property. So now we just insert this identity that, you know, when you integrate over sigma, uh, you get a delta function in G. If you integrate over G, you get one. So just insert this in here. Uh, and then you notice that once you've inserted this, then G is basically the Green's function. So I can replace um, this object here by G. So I'll get a G to the four. Uh, and then the remaining action is quadratic in the fermion. So I can integrate over the fermions. And then I get this famous G sigma path integral. Uh, actually, we had in the early 1900s, oh, sorry, <laughs> not early 2000s, uh, but not exactly in this form. And this is a much more convenient form. Um, so basically, it's a path. Now it's you started out with a path integral over uh, n fermionic fields. You end up with a path integral over just two fields, g and sigma, which are bilocal in time. Okay. Uh, and this is an exact expression uh, for the average partition function. So the action here, there's a is it log dead. Um, and uh, okay. What was the number at the end of the previous slide? Have you taken the limit of n? Uh, yes, I've just dropped. So n has to be sent to zero. It's a replica index. Uh, so we just take everything to be replica diagonal. Now we have studied what happens with n. When you're in a spin glass phase, with such model scans, related models can realize in the spin glass phase you have to worry about that index. But as long as you're not in the spin glass phase then uh, at least, you know, you can just ignore it. Uh, it becomes more important when you take moments of Z, you know, and so on. But right now, just for Z bar, that's, you know, it just makes no difference. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's yes, yeah. So strictly speaking, this is, this is going to give you the average Green's function and the average self energy. Suppose you want to get the average uh, of G squared or something like that. You want moments of these quantities, then you will have to worry about the replicas. But at the moment, I'm not going to worry. I'm just computing the partition function, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> we can, those things can also be computed. And are important in some things. <laughs> okay. So this is your, uh, your path integral. Uh, okay, so now you notice that the only place where some memory of the underlying fermions is present is in uh, is in this term right here, this d by d tau that came from the uh, you know kinetic energy of the kinematic term for the fermions. Okay, I won't spend a lot of you know I'm not going to describe all the details of the solution. This worked out in great detail in many places, but basically the point is that at low frequencies, uh, this term can be neglected. So if we just throw out that term, then the remaining action has a huge symmetry. It has a complete symmetry under both 
time limit, it has an emergent symmetry that the original model didn't have uh, under time parameterizations and gauge transformations. Um, let me ignore the gauge, that's little g. So time parameterization is here. So f of sigma, let's put time on a circle. f of sigma is any monotonic function uh, from a circle to a circle. Uh, um, then you can just, I invite you to just make this transformation from tau to sigma. Uh, and you put it back in here, you get the same action. So there seems to be an infinite set of, uh, uh, you know, equal action configuration of G and Sigma. Uh, now at the saddle point, we're not interested in all of them. We're only interested in ones that are only functions of tau one minus tau two. Uh, those are the physical ones. <laughs> uh, but when you're doing the pattern or goal beyond the saddle point, which we will do, you need to do beyond this. You do have to worry about this this time you parameterization set. So effectively, this is you know you can call this a theory of gravity, but it's a it's a theory that g and the sigma are, are related to through this time of parameterization to metric fluctuations of a black hole. Uh, okay. All right. So then, what what do you do? You find a saddle point. Okay. So the idea is that you have some big space g and sigma. You have an action for G and sigma, and so there's a big space of G and sigma. There's a you know infinite dimensional space, and there's a saddle point which is sigma s and G s. And now we have to do fluctuations. So there's a huge space of fluctuation about the saddle point, but I'm going to go along a valley. It's going to go along the steepest descent. Usually, you're going to go along a valley, and what is this valley? Well, this valley is basically this time implementation composed on J sub s. So that's explicitly this is what it is. You you give me a J sub G sub s, that's the title point, and then I get a new G, which is the time parameterization of the old. Okay. So so now my integral over this whole space, this whole integral over G G G sigma will become an integral just over f. But I'm only going to go along this direction. Now, this is what I learned from Kitab and Malaspin and Stanford. <laughs> we didn't know this. All right. Okay, so then now it's just a matter of figuring out what is the action. And the phi has to do with the gauge transformation for the complex case, so just ignore that. So we just need to figure out what this action is. Um, so Basically, this involves knowing something about the symmetries of G sub S. So G sub S has, is a conformal solution, so it has a conformal symmetry. And then there's this time parameterization symmetry. So then the whole fat integral turns out to be a fat integral over time parameterization, which is, the, I guess, the space diff U1, the spaces of all the functions of the circles itself. And you have to mod it out by SL2R, which is a conformal symmetry. So when all said and done, this is the fat integral you get. Sorry? Is that minus saddle point? No. So if you ignore, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. If you ignore this term, then yes, this, the whole thing is degenerate. But that term is present. So because this term is present, there will be kind of a slight uphill direction. This is a soft direction, but it's not totally flat. Okay. And that slight uphill feature. Is what the short chain gets. Yeah. So the motivation is that you want to take about the energy if you don't take it. Yeah, you want the low in the low temperature density of states that, that I already showed you. This is not... <laughs> so if so, through all these symmetry arguments, uh, you get effectively what you can call as a nonlinear sigma model on the space diff u one slash sl two r. And so that's the nonlinear signal model there. This is the maps of the circle to itself. There's another U1, let's forget about that. And this is modded out by SR2R. Uh, and there's your action. And forget this, that has to be the charge fluctuations. So there's your Schwarzschild uh, from the map of the circle to itself. It's formulated by this. And there it is. So this. You know, this looks like a horrible action with all kinds of derivatives uh, and, and uh, 
but because you mod out by SF two R, it's actually perfectly well defined. It's positive definite, and it can be computed exactly. Now, with the next time we'll show the exact uh, evaluation of this pattern. So you evaluate this pattern exactly, and you get the result actually. Okay, so so that's the SYK story, which you can you know derive on its own without ever knowing anything about gravity. Uh, we never did it because we knew nothing about gravity. We had many other reasons, we're not smart enough. Uh, but uh, uh, clearly it's inspired by pe things people are doing gravity. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so now if you do that partition function, uh, then you will get the same square of the gamma. So what you get from this is a, is a gamma here. There's a temperature here, you get a temperature to the three halves effect. And is that temperature to the three, three halves factor when you do a, a inverse of plus transform? You know. So, in terms of the entropy itself, like I showed this result here, it's minus three halves. So, the, all of that work gives you this minus three half times log. That's all it does. <laughs> so, this three halves has to do with the fact that the mod SL2 are the SL2R has three generators. Each gives you when you do a Gaussian integral of square root of gamma, get three of them, and that's all that matters. And once you have that, then you take the inverse of class transform. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> Uh, it's just, I mean, to me, it's remarkably beautiful mathematics. So I come up with most of it, uh, other than the number SEO uh, with my friends Antoine and uh, Olivier. Um, and, uh, but it's not rigorous. It doesn't look rigorous to me at all. <laughs> and hopefully, more can be learned by a more rigorous analysis of this very simple to define model. All right, now let's go to black holes. <laughs> okay. So, I know there are many people here who don't know anything about black holes, but neither did I. <laughs> Maybe still don't. Uh, so what is a black hole? Uh, well, a black hole is a solution of Einstein's equations with a horizon and so on. I won't write down the metric here, but I'm going to look at a very particular type of black hole. Now, any black hole that has a net charge Q. So if there's a charge, so there's some, you know, Right in the center of the black hole, there's some matter and charge of some mass M and charge Q sitting there. Uh, and it's so dense and so charged that, that the space time distorts so much that uh, there's a horizon. So I'm outside, I'm, I'm outside the horizon. So there's no matter or any charge outside the horizon. I'm just solving the vacuum equations of uh, Einstein and Maxwell. See. Einstein's equations, Maxwell's equations in the vacuum with the boundary condition that somewhere in the center of the black hole is net charge and a net mass. That's all. I don't need to know anything about what's in there other than the mass and the charge because I'm far away from, the, from where the, all that mass is. So, so that there's an exact solution known called the Reisner Rostrom solution. I, you know, not much point in writing now. There's some complicated polynomial terms for the metrics. Okay. So there's a horizon. All right, so, so there's a solution of a black hole with a horizon with some charge and mass inside it. Just, and everything outside is just vacuum. Uh, well, there's electric fields and gravitational fields, but nothing other than that. All right, so, so what did Hawking uh, do? Well, Hawking said, well, let me compute the partition for quantum partition function uh, of this theory. So I just take the action that Einstein and Maxwell gave us and do the Feynman pattern integral with the one over h bar factor about the saddle point of the black hole uh, of this uh, of the metric and the vector potential. All right, that's not even surely not even a well-defined thing. Who knows what this is? But Hawking boldly said, I don't care, I just take the saddle point. Let me just evaluate it at the saddle point. And why could you even imagine you could do such a thing? Well, we're going to do, take this action in imaginary time. And if you look at the uh, geometry of space-time, 
uh, in imaginary time. So this is the imaginary time direction. So imaginary time is usually just a circle. And this defines the temperature, which now would be the Hawking temperature of the black hole. Uh, and if you take the rising and autumn solution in imaginary time, you find that it has this form of a cigar. So this is the radial direction. This is time. Uh, and I'm not showing the angular directions. This picture, this is the radial direction. This is the angular direction. I'm not showing time. So these are really pictures of the same thing, but on different projections. And this is imaginary time. And so at each point on this space, the cigar is the sphere, which is the angular directions. Okay. So what you find when you look at this uh, metric of a black hole, it basically terminates at the horizon. You don't even, you never go inside, it just blocks it out. So then life becomes simple. You, you don't need to know what's inside the black hole. We just compute this pattern goal and the side point outside the black hole. Okay, so that's my pedestrian summary of their brilliant calculation. And when you do that calculation carefully, uh, you get this answer. You find that uh, the there's an entropy for the black hole. This is the side point. This is just the side point, and the entropy uh, is area divided by four in Planck units. Okay, uh, involves an H bar, of course. Uh, and where does the H bar come in? The H bar actually just comes in from here in the definition of temperature. That's the only place it really comes in. Uh, so that gives you the entropy. Uh, and A is the area of the horizon. And you can also solve Einstein's equations in, in the low temperature limit. And you find that the area is a constant plus a term linear in the area. So the entropy in the zero temperature limit, which is also called the extremal limit, is that some number proportional to the area, and then there's a linear in temperature correction. And in fact, this is the area is zero. So in fact, this is fully, you know, nothing is no unknown here. All I need to know is the charge of the black hole and the temperature. And in fact, I can, there's an equation of state which relates Q and T to the mass of the black hole. Yeah. It isn't because of the H bar, it's an, uh, that comes in in the definition of the uh, of time. So basically you put a condition that this metric is smooth at the horizon. And, and that's pretty much what brings in H bar at temperature. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, you know, even today when I look at this, it's amazing that this gives the right answer. Like, Why should this, it sounds totally ridiculous when you first look at it. <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you, so you know you've got an entropy. Now that entropy presumably has to do with all the mass and charge inside the black hole. We are outside, and we're just computing some pattern outside the horizon. You know nothing about what's inside. Some degrees of freedom, and we can count how many there are. <laughs> okay, and you know even how it depends on temperature and so on. yeah. This is Hawking's calculation. What's the thing I can? Well, I mean, everything that's happened since Hawking, yeah, you know, string theory, and, and you'll see SYK also, yeah. <laughs> there, there's so many checks of this, of super symmetric black holes and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Yeah. Some you have the horizon, and then you just compute the area. Yeah. So you have the metric ds so squared, and you have the, the horizon temperature. Depends. It's the proper area, so the you know the proper time is an invariant, so the area is also an invariant. It's independent of the metric. <laughs> Uh, units of length squared, but, but it's perfectly well defined. It's independent of your metric choice. Anything else? Okay, well, the only thing I haven't written down here is the form of the mass in terms of Q and T. Maybe I should write it down somewhere. Okay. <laughs>
All right. So now uh, I want you to notice something. So we look at the entropy, it's constant for the term linear in T. And this was among one of the things and many other things that I noticed in 2010, although no one paid attention. This looks exactly like the SYK model. Of course, I've prepared you to see that <laughs> as a term zero temperature entropy, a zero temperature entropy, and a term linear entropy. Uh, okay, now we know exactly why that's the case. Uh, and we can even derive the connection. All right. So to see that, and so, so what we'd like to do is, if I'm just a pure gravitational person, I would like to compute a correction to the next correction from the path integral about the saddle point. Can I compute the next term? And, and it turns out that even the next term is universal, that it doesn't depend on exactly what's inside the black hole. And it's in fact exactly the same as the term you get for the SYK model. Uh, all right. So what is how do you why can you do that? All right. So this the re, there's a reason I took a charged black hole. It has a very special property uh, that if you go to very low energies, uh, space time, if you were falling into the black hole, and as you near the horizon, you would think that space is one dimension, uh, roughly speaking. <laughs> So, and that one dimension is the direction zeta. So here you're falling into the black hole along zeta. And, and the basic point is that as you were falling in, you would only see this one point and all the other directions would just factor out away from it. A more formal way to say it, if you look at the met horizon north of solution and take the near horizon limit, it factorizes into this one plus one dimensional metric along time t and uh, direction zeta, this is not real time, and the angular direction, this is omega two is the angular two dimensional sphere. Okay. So there's a factorization in ADS two cross S two. So this, this is actually only happened in three in a dimensions above. Two plus one things are somewhat different. Okay. So, so this means that if I want the low temperature properties, uh, I'm just going to assert that, I can forget about the angular directions. Not quite correct, and, and I'll give you the, I mean, this is now understood very precisely, I'll mention a little bit, um, but let's just focus on the angular direction. So now what you notice, this metric is what's called ADS2, so that's anti dissider space in one plus one dimensions, uh, and that's a highly symmetric metric. In fact, you know, it's like a sphere, but in some <laughs> other metric space. I mean, a sphere is a symmetric space, then every part of the sphere is the same. Similarly, ADS2, uh, I don't have a picture of ADS2 here, uh, is also a symmetric space with uniform negative curvature, at least the Euclidean version of this hyperbolic space. All right. So we just, if we want to compute the fluctuations, we have to compute the fluctuations. Uh, only in, in the theory, which all the fields only depend on the radial direction and time. All right, so that's so now you do a dimensional reduction. Start with a theory in three plus one dimensions. You keep all the fields, you keep all the components of the metric, you keep all the gauge field components, and then you just say every component only depends on the radial direction and time. And when you do that, you get a theory of fields in one space and one time dimension. But that theory has more than just the metric because some of the components of the metric in higher dimension will become the metric in the lower dimension. And other components will become scalar fields. <laughs> and in the end, if you do all of that, uh, you just get one scalar field and then you get a theory which is called JT gravity, which I will not write out for you, but this is the purely gravitational calculation, which, you know, Hawking could have done it. If you thought of it, you this might hurt, no doubt. Nothing new here that was known a long time ago. It is for finding the dimensional reduction from three plus one to one plus one. Okay. So now you have a theory in one space and one time dimensions. And it turns out to be rather simple because in one space dimension, the metric is pure gauge. It can almost be completely gauged away, uh, except a certain boundary value. So in terms of this picture, what happens is you get a theory of quantum gravity 
in one space in one time direction here. And you can gauge away almost the bulk metric. The only thing you're left over is fluctuations on the boundary at one time. This is not actually the time direction, but now imagine that's the time direction and the boundary is fluctuating in time. So that's really the fluctuation of this R sub H in time. Uh, that's the only thing, that's the only physical degree of, uh, physical degree of freedom left over, where you cross over from two dimensional space time to four dimensional space. And this was shown by Manda Sena and Yang. All right, so you can go from three plus one to one plus one, and then by you can do a holographic mapping explicitly, and lo and behold, you end up with the same action. <laughs> Exactly the same action that I had for SYK, which I almost derived for you. You have skipped a few steps. In fact, if anything, they're simpler because you can make every one of these steps exactly. Uh, and you know, we will match all the numbers and everything. All right, so now you're, you're all set. So Hawking gave us the saddle point answer. It's A of T over four. And now I, I know how to do this bad integral. So I, and I just match a few coupling constants. And when I'm done, I get this three half log T. So I have the Hawking answer, and then a minus three half log T. And then of course I can take the inverse of Laplace transform and get the cinch density of states. <clears throat> now, these type of calculations have been done for a while. In fact, Ashok Sen did something like this. Uh, I think he did not account for this zero mode or didn't realize that this Schwarzschild zero mode gives you some interesting temperature dependence. Uh, and, but all of that has been done correctly just last week to the beautiful paper by Luca Eliasu, Samir Murthy, and Paul uh, Keen Zurachi. I need to look at it. Uh, and what they show, yes, this three halves is completely universal. There's another term which is temperature independent, but involves the log of the area of the black hole. With this bizarre coefficient of 559 over 180, which you can find in that paper. Yes. <laughs> but in this case, it's the same thing here. Right. Well, here the point is the point here is that gravity only makes sense of the coarse grain theory. The gravity is only giving you coarse grain information. Uh, and it's, it's precisely the coarse grading that, you know, you only have the average over all the microstates of a black hole, do you get gravity. Uh, and, if, and, and you get a very simple theory of gravity provided the microstates are chaotic enough. That, that's kind of the general lesson. Yeah. And why is that just five? Five? Five. Oh, five. Well, uh, right, so there's a U1, emergent U1 gauge symmetry for a charged black hole. Uh, and so in that case, uh, G is e to the phi. This G here is a gauge transformation. Uh, for the charged black hole, there's also a Maxwell field, a mu. And uh, phi is the boundary value of the Maxwell field on the boundary graviton. So, yeah, so that, so my contribution here was to actually determine the phi part. Uh, and with, in this paper with my friends, actually, I don't know, I don't have that. Uh, this part was done by others. Well, also in one of my papers, I put all the coupling constants and matched it out precisely with all factors of two <laughs> and pi and so on. Anyway, um, right. So as far as the temperature dependence concerned, but this is all we care about in the end. Uh, then uh, this is what it is. This this extra term only determines the normalization of the density of states. And that's also kind of universal. In a theory with the only low energy degrees of freedom are the graviton and the, and the photon, which is our universe. Okay, other mass plus degrees of freedom, then there will be some corrections. <laughs> yeah. So the action, the third action has the expression action, expression theory. That confused every individual and thinks there's something different. Um, well, so here, uh, yeah, so this this has to do with the angular mode. There's other modes you have to worry about. So it's not just the action part, the angle of the action. Yeah, yeah, this really comes from uh, from from going back to the three plus one dimensional theory and, and taking into account 
some other zero modes. So those modes are kind of gapped by the size of the, they have a finite size gap. They're not truly zero mode because on a sphere, they have a gap over the volume of the sphere or something. Uh, so they give you something in log in the area, but they don't give you a log of temperature. If you want D of E, I need to know the temperature depend. This will just determine the normalization of D of E, three factor, which I wasn't paying any attention. Uh, but so the blue part that you can get it from here. The blue part is just the swatch length. All I get uh, is the three halves. <laughs> and then this is the dimensional analysis. This is the only thing. <laughs> yeah. So that extra thing in the pink. Yeah. Uh, that also comes from my swing. All right. So part of this was gotten by Sen from completely ignoring uh, the SYK mode. And then this paper, as of last week, uh, redid Sen's calculation and confirmed he was correct for those modes. But then he found, they found also that the SYK mode gives another correction, which is of the same form. So this number was obtained by ESU at all. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and it involves a both, it involves some terms are identified by Sen and some terms are identified by them from the short term. But the SYK also is supposed to have the same. Uh, it, that is slightly different, and I am going to bring it down. So that, yeah, you have to, it had to do with, you know, probably normalizing the path in the world properly. I'm just confused. Yeah. You can start with 4D gravity and reduce to the two degree angular coordinate. Yes. Or you could start with 5D gravity and reduce to the degree. Yes. Yeah. The extra modes you get from the sphere and so would be a little bit different. So the 5D will change some of this, might change this. Yeah. But it will not change this. Yeah. yeah. But it would, not the particularly so there are two contributions to this. One is universal and dimension independent. And there's another one that's dimension independent. And, and Sen identified the dimension dimension dependent terms. And Ilyas Umuti to actually got dimension independent terms. That's why K corresponds to the dimensional independent terms. Yeah. Yeah. What about the gap in your space? There is no gap. So I was just going to show you some pictures. <laughs> so, so now you can, you know, uh, right. So, so, you know, now we are, okay, this is my somewhat grandly stated, can you find a quantum simulation? Now, this is what people do now, right? Of the inside of a black hole, meaning that you have some quantum degrees of freedom, which is at least the counting matches the entropy outside the black hole. Uh, and the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, and this is the density of states from the three halves log p. The extra log term I was just determining, Sunil, all have to do with powers of the area that appear in the extra three factor. So there's some power area to some strange power here. If you care about those, you have to worry about that. I don't, I have, I don't care about it. I'm just looking at the energy, the independent of energy. Okay, I think certainly the, no, I think Ashok Sen wasn't completely explicit, but certainly the implication. It seemed to be from uh, certainly from the uh, the discussion, the string theory literature in those days, that this D of P, this factor here, times the free factor, is a degeneracy of something. It is not a degeneracy of anything. There is no degeneracy. It's the density of state which has got cinch squared of it. On the other hand, if you take a supersymmetric black hole or a supersymmetric SYK model, then the density of state looks like that. There is a degeneracy. These are the BPS states. Uh, and D of A is just a count of the BPS states. Uh, and there's a gap, which is about a one over N. Uh, and, and then there's a continuum. So this particular form, I guess, first appeared in this paper by also by Gustavo and Luca and others uh, a couple of years ago. So, so there's a big difference whether a theory has low energy supersymmetry or not. Of course, they could be high energy supersymmetry, I don't care. But if there's low energy supersymmetry, then you get a degeneracy. If there isn't, you do not. Yeah. So the DOV is not measuring a degeneracy except for uh, supersymmetric black holes. Sorry? In case, you say yes, yes. Well, extremal by definition, because you're looking at zero energy. So extremal means temperature goes to zero. Temperature goes to zero or lower energy. That's so the mass is it's very close to the extreme limit because the mass is a unique function of charge and temperature. 
So I like to forget about the mass, <laughs> fix Q and change temperature. That's very natural here from the SYK point of view. So the solution, really, really like to think of this as like a glass which has some entropy and it uh, no, it's the opposite of a glass. A glass is something that freezes. So when they were replica symmetry breaking and so on. Here, it's really, it's a new type of state. It's a chaotic many body state, which does not freeze. Uh, it's not stuck. You know, the point is, yeah, you have all these levels which are really close to each other. And every one of those levels essentially samples all of phase space. In a glass, each level is frozen. This part of phase space, that level frozen that, but there's no freezing here. Every level samples all of phase space, but in a very different way. Whereas in a glass, you have many levels, many states, which are in different parts of phase space entirely, and they don't talk to each other. So it's, it's in fact, it's the exact opposite of a glass. Okay. All right, I think. <laughs> Uh, a four finish. Uh, okay, I have no strange metal. Uh, that's fine. This is good. I, I this is what I really wanted to talk about. The strange metal is too grungy for mathematicians. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm pretty much done. I mean, let me just quickly flash a little bit about strange metals. So, uh, in strange metals, uh, well, okay, they're found everywhere. They have a linear resistivity, uh, and they have some strange p log p specific heat, and then they have strange behavior in the optical conductivity, various logs in it, uh, and then they have uh, marginal bony liquid self energy. So sorry, if you don't know this, then you don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you want a model for this. So let me just say, so what we, and this is work with Avish Karhayo and Ilya, uh, and uh, we start not with the SYK model, but what People now call the Yukawa SYK model uh, in this form by Ilya, uh, where you have fermions and bosons with a random Yukawa couple. Now, this model has no spatial structure at all. And the entire game is to how to bring this to finite dimensional space. And so we've tried various things over the years, but now we think we have one approach that seems to really work well. And basically, you take the fermions and you give them some spatial structure at the Fermi surface. Then you have some. Uh, coupling between the fermions that you introduce by a scalar field. Uh, and then you take the scalar field and you make, oops, make its coupling random. So in the end, you have, this is the theory you have to work with. Uh, you have a Fermi surface. So everything in blue is random in space and fixed. Everything in red is a dynamical field. So you have a scalar phi and a fermion psi. Uh, and the point is that the coupling between the fermion and the boson uh, has to be random and straight. That's the key thing that gives you all the strange metal behavior. Uh, nothing else does it. Uh, and then you can solve this in the usual SYK type large and limits and we summarize. <laughs> That's a whole other talk. And uh, yeah, but I think I stuck to the things that uh, people are uh, so, what is SYK? So, you know, just to summarize, uh, it's a solvable model without particle like excitations, meaning that the low lying states are completely disconnected with each other and very different sampling of the all of phase space. Uh, and it has very rapid thermalization and many body chaos. Uh, and in fact, the chaos type is independent of U of any coupler. Um, and the low energy theory is a theory of time of conversation, which is also the theory of gravity in an energy stream. Uh, and from this, you can uh, reproduce the density of states that uh, uh, is matched the density of states that Beckett and Hogan computed, but also compute corrections. Um, and uh, and all of this done, we know at the before you know you know the underlying you have a Hamiltonian which has a completely unitary discrete spectrum. Uh, and you can see exactly how all the averaging is happening. Um, and you know, I think that this kind of picture has uh, been important in uh, work by others on understanding the page curve uh, of the entanglement entropy. And yeah, and that's the part I really care about. But if you want to know more, uh, talk to Ilya or something. <laughs> Come talk to me.
All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. What, what is known about the structure of the Not very much. Yeah, I think that's really the big open problem. Yeah, yeah. So how do you characterize all of these states? Yeah. Uh, other than saying they're chaotic. I, I think there probably is a lot to be done there. Uh, and I think there have been recent papers by, uh, you know, this, there's a very, I think by Henry Lin has something in the, uh, where he's trying to understand something about the states. Even Baldassena had something for the supersymmetric case. I mean, there's also some chaos here in these states. That's that's the part that Baldassena has been studying. Uh, yeah, I think that's really the big question. Is to want to say more about this, all these states. Yeah, uh, and exactly characterize them better. And that will tell you more about the structure inside of black hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think any um, when you work in, in in places where the positive is high, we use like this order, we expect to have like a band, exponential band scale of states? Yeah, okay. yeah. At least here in this calculation, is it really a sharp? So uh, exponential. You told if you have a single particle moving in a band, and there are these Lipschitz tails yeah. at the very bottom. Well, the point is here. The way to think about it is you have a Fermi surface. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the very the bottom of the band here has nothing to do with the Lipschitz scale. Mm -hmm. It has to do with mid gap states at, at the Fermi level. So you're looking at the center of the band uh, mm -hmm. and all the particles interacting the center of the band. Uh, and so, so you go from the center of the band of the one particle states and you go to the bottom of the band, the many particle states. Okay. Uh, so, and it turns out then the bottom of the band has its own very different set of uh, singularity. Now it is true that if you go way down here, e to the minus n, there is something here, uh, which is just given by random matrix theory of different types. Uh, I think it's just random matrix theory. Some you take a fully random matrix and you take a different, slightly different double scale limit, you will you will see some sort of chaos here. But I was just wondering because this seems to be the exact same calculation you do for that, just you know, with the the factory parameterizations and. They get a non-linear signal model with the two uh -huh. the band. Right. Okay. So you do you agree? I see. If you have a short chain action there, or is, is uh, more, it's something like, different, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have like a, it's a non-linear signal model with some super space with uh, yeah, you can do replicate specific. Yeah, space. yeah. Yeah. No, this is a bit more complicated than that. Um mm -hmm. right. So you know, we're here we are not, yeah, we're Let's say we are not e to the minus n between the ground level, but you're really looking. So the, the question you're asking is you have some ground state. Mm -hmm. What are the fluctuations in the ground state energy? What's the probability the ground state gets even lower? Yeah. That's a very, you know, it's a, it'll go even lower and it'll be a, some range of order e to the minus n. I'm not asking that question. I'm saying, okay, I'm not worried about the bottom few levels. And I'm, I'm worried really about the <laughs> levels of. So, of e to the n levels, you know, even a tiny window here has e to the n levels. I'm worried about those. So it's a, it's a slightly different scaling. Yeah, That's a good question. Yeah. It seems like a lot of this are the same. It's like first going over the microstates of one, first going over the one that has like a energy of the same thermodynamics. Yes. Um, but it seems like people are also using these models to try to understand gravity and like resolution of all these paradoxes. Right. Yeah. Is there any risk that that sort of the microscopic mm -hmm. physics of these two models is actually very different because they have same mutual energy results in there? Well, I mean, you know, but there is a derivation. I mean, this is you can derive this. They have the same slightly course. They have the same theory course and level. And this can be used not just for the partition function, but, but many other things. You know, as people have done the entanglement entropy and the page curve and so on. Uh, in the end, did you need, need SYK? No. You could have done this without even knowing about SYK. I mean, everything here could have been done by Hawking in principle. So I, I think from a condensed matter point of view, I think the point is that SYK gave you a roadmap and a confidence on which direction to go. <laughs> and once you saw that, you just don't even need SYK at that point. 
I mean, of course, it's all for low dimensional gravity. Now, how do you extend this to neutral black holes in higher dimensions? Yeah, so that's a much harder question. So the difference is that when you go to higher dimensions, uh, then you do have uh, sort of what's called a black hole transition. So instead of getting a density of states that looks like this, you know, exponentially dense all the way down to zero temperature, you have the Hawking page transition. And for a while, the levels are actually not exponentially dense. And then there's a critical point energy above which they are exponentially dense. So it's actually much harder to study them because what you have access to are actually the very smallest, simplest operators, which correspond to the very lower states, which are not really the black hole states. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think, you know, some of this work recently by Witten and others on von Neumann algebra is, is trying to address those similar questions that can be completely addressed here using in higher dimensions. <laughs> so you're above the black hole transition. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> super symmetry for you. Uh, I guess you have these, uh, you know, these very special zero energy states because they're all uh, BPS states. You have, you know, the Hamiltonian is the square of some Q charge, and you just need things that are which are annihilated by Q, and uh, you get a whole bunch of. I mean, you can see this even in SYK. Uh, in fact, when Bo, when they first found those, you know, just take this operator of three fermions and you just look at its eigenvalues and find lots of zero eigenvalues. We don't know much about what those states are. And in fact, that's the question that Marla Zena's recent work is trying to address is you know, the wave function of these states is also quite complicated. Uh, you can count them because you can use certain index here in supersymmetry, so you can count them. But why, other than that, what do they describe and what are their properties? Um, I think that's a topic of research. But I'm not doing any of that. I'm working on strange metals. <laughs> but I keep reading these papers. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a topic of papers. Um, <laughs> of all the references you mentioned, yeah. I recommend one sort of a textbook that I got in the fall with actually making action to change the gravity of the Uh Well, I, I think the papers by Joaquin Turiachi, that in fact, the last two papers I mentioned just even last week. They, they really have everything worked out there, yeah. And even, the, yeah, this one is very good. I know there's one earlier one by just Luca and uh, Joaquin. Yeah, just search for Turiachi and he has some very nice things. <laughs> I talked to him, He's, I, I just learned a lot of this by talking to him. <laughs> so there's Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Actually, I'm very interested in the stent metal paths. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> I, I can give another talk or okay. something, uh, maybe in the group meeting or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Can you send me the uh, slides? Or... Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can. Uh, I think if you uh, I have close the Zoom, it will automatically turn off the recording. Yeah.